Hello and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. Sean Kinchella, proud Gamilaroi and Wiradjuri photographer based on the south coast of Australia, joins the show. Sean is a true innovator for modern digital indigenous art using his graphic design skills to produce NRL jersey designs alongside his hip-hop and R&B music and photography. His images are primarily coastal, featuring wildlife, stunning landscapes, or even underwater imagery. Known as local famous on Instagram, Sean explores the south coast of New South Wales to create his stunning images. Shaped by Indigenous heritage, his unique perspective blends storytelling with respect for culture, evident in his diverse portfolio from astrophotography to underwater scenes. We discuss ethical photography practices, maintaining creative momentum, and Sean's passion for exploration and unique perspectives, along with a lot more. I hope you enjoy the show. G'day, Sean. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Thanks for inviting me on. Uh, Absolute pleasure. Followed you a little bit. Love your work. Why don't you tell people who you are, where you're from, and what what got you into photography yeah sure so my name is sean kinchula on instagram a lot of people know me as local famous or local famous photography so i live on the far south coast of new south wales near nabrima paradise god's country absolutely what got me into photography was really being around the south coast i was born in a small town called barrel where there's just a lot of bushlands and rivers and that and then when I first moved to the south coast as a kid I, I wasn't used to seeing beaches or crystal clear water I just felt like I was on holidays in Fiji somewhere. Nice. So then, yeah, so quickly, I quickly snapped up a camera and really dove into it. Like really, yeah, just anything with long exposures, astrophotography, underwater, obviously. Yep. And yeah, like it's just become like, oh, what's the word? It's become a fascination. Okay, cool. So let's talk a little bit about where you're from and how that journey started into getting into photography. A lot of people talk about just enjoying being in the landscape and seeing stuff and saying, all right, well, that looks like it could be a picture taking their camera out. Was that how it was started for you or? Yeah, I, I'm an artist as well. So I'm a graphic okay. designer, a painter. Yeah. So when I look at a landscape, I see like a story behind it. Mm-hmm. And I guess a lot of that comes from my indigenous heritage as well. Okay. So like when I see a lot of seascapes, I see like shapes of animals out of them. And around the South Coast, we've got loads in them. We've got horse rock, horse head rock, kangaroo rock, shark head rock. We've got so, like the landscape on the South Coast, there's so many stories to tell. Yeah. And it just, yeah, it's fascinating taking a picture and then the picture and the landscape telling the story itself. And depending on the viewer, everyone sees that story in a different way as well. Yeah, right. You mentioned Indigenous heritage. I'm interested in talking about how that has shaped some of your photographic style and how those stories interconnect with the landscape in which you're you're actually taking photos. Yeah. Like I was saying before, I'm an artist as well. So I've been painting since I was in primary school and a lot of my inspiration for photography and painting comes from both the land. So like I might be flying my drone, taking photos of the ocean and I'll see certain patterns from the water ripples and that, and then I'll paint that onto a canvas and tell the story of the waters through the patterns and whatnot. And same as photography, like I try and see something that's, that's not there, like the animal sculptures, the flow of water, the way it flows around the seascapes and really try and put a story behind it. Mm. And then it makes me think, especially being around here, there's a lot, there's not a lot of light pollution. So being out at nighttime, take a photo as the stars and whatnot, and it makes me think how like my ancestors would have viewed the stars back in them days. And yeah. yeah. And just growing up, listening to stories on my nan and that, my nan was stone generation. So uh, my family originally come from Maury. Okay. And my, my nan was relocated. So that's how we ended up on the South Coast. Yes. Being, living away from family and that, I've been drawn to photography and art a lot more because that's my way of connecting with my culture while yeah. I live away from my family. That's awesome. Yeah. And I guess what, really started you with getting into photography itself what was it that sort of triggered the the bug just it's definitely a bug for me i know that (laughs) 
Yeah, I, I'm just anything creative. I'm I'm into doing anything creative, and I think with photography, I like a challenge. I love learning new things, and it just feels like with photography, there's just an endless amount of things you can learn from long exposures. Yeah, the underwater, like focusing, it's all a challenge to me, and it's something that I've just found myself. I haven't stopped learning. I'm YouTubing things every day. I'm reaching out to other photographers and see what gear they're using. And yeah, just trying to really develop my own style, which is like really difficult. And I've read a lot that it takes a lot of photographers years and years to develop their own style. Absolutely. Absolutely. You mentioned setting creative challenges for yourself. Do you have a process around that or is it something that's a bit more organic? It's something that's, I think everything that I do kind of comes natural, but I try and do things that no one else has done. A lot of the places down here have become really popular and everyone's Everyone has a photo of Horsehead Rock. Everyone has the Milky Way behind Horsehead Rock. So I'm, I find myself venturing out, walking along the coastline, looking for places that not many people have been to yep. and looking for an image that no one else has done yet. Yeah. I think you've got, you mentioned a few of the iconic places. I, I was down that way myself and yes, I shot Camel Rock several times and <laughs> I actually think I, I got one of, one of the nicest shots of Camel while I was down there, but we stayed at Gillard's as well, at Gillard's Beach, which I know is, it's reasonably well known, but it's not, it's a little bit off the beaten track. It's not one that you can just drive past and go, oh, there it is. You've got yeah. to know, you got to know where to go to get there. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's a lot like a place, Cudigy. Yeah. Have you been to Cudigy? Yeah, I've been to Cudigy, yeah. Yeah, One Tree, a lot of people know, like they can see it, but they don't know how to get to it. Yep. So yeah, it's a good thing, like in a way, yeah. It restricts the number of people. Yeah, yeah. Do you set yourself goals and is it important for you to have goals in your photography? Yeah, I, I, everything I do is goal orientated. Otherwise, I feel like I've become stagnant mm, and I get okay. a bit bored. So I try and set myself goals like this year, I wanted to focus more on star trails, like full star trails and focus more on split level underwater photography. Yeah. So there was a lot of places that... I wanted to go to Horsehead Rock and get a half underwater, like a split level shot with Horsehead Rock from the puddle that's in front of it. Yep. I feel like that hadn't been done before. Another goal I wanted to do was go to Bermagui Blue Pools, yeah. get a half underwater, half above shot with the Milky Way at night. Nice. Yeah. That'd be cool. Just, yeah, yeah. Something different, something that hasn't been done before. And I think that's the biggest challenge. In terms of those sorts of challenges, obviously experimenting and doing things like that. That also comes with a, a level of failure or failure. You've got the I, idea in your head and you go out and try it and sometimes it doesn't work. How do you deal with that? It's frustrating. It really is. I find like instead of cutting my camera gear out, I feel like my iPhone's my best friend. If I'm out scouting a place, I'll just take photos of the place and I'll try and set it to the focal length of my iPhone and I'll take several shots so I know which length to bring when I'm actually coming down to do the task. But it, it, it can be really frustrating when you've got an image in your mind or something you want to do and it just doesn't work. I think split level photography, underwater photography is one of the hardest things I've done. It's so hard to focus underwater and above the water and just so much technique to it. So it's quite frustrating when you're out in the field and like you've driven a couple of hours to get to a place and it's just not happening. Yeah. But at the same time, I, me personally, I work better under pressure. I, look around and see if there's any other spots around in that area where I could take a photo that I can at least take something home. Yeah, cool, cool. In terms of that experimentation, when it does work, what are you recording how you've done it so that you can use it again later or are you just trying to do stuff, stuff totally unique and once you nail it, that's it, done, you're on to the Yeah, next. that's, that's it. I am loading all my settings and what I'm doing in my notepads, but once I nail something, I I'm bad for it. I'm compulsive and I just do it over and over again until I feel like yeah, oh, I'm, just, I'm doing this too much now. Yeah, I know. I know that feeling. I think you, you just mentioned that you're still searching for your style. Like I can see a sense of it starting to appear. Certainly in your more recent stuff, it, it, it's starting to look very consistent. And I don't mean that the image looks the same. I mean that there's a style around yeah. the feeling. It's starting to become more cohesive. Where do you see yourself on that style journey and where, where do you see it taking you in, in the future? Oh, I feel like I'm starting to get there. I feel like what you're saying, it's becoming more consistent. 
I look at my Insta profile and I can see the difference from when I first started. Everything just, it doesn't look like it interlocks. And as I'm slowly coming to now, it all starts to look consistent and not the same, but it has like that same style. So I feel like where it's taken me now is I'm trying to merge what I'm doing with astrophotography, also with my underwater photography and yeah, just everything I'm doing. I'm pretty much doing everything like landscape, seascape. I'm trying to find a way to make that all connect with each other and have that same look. Yeah, cool. And a lot of that's just spending hours and messing around with color grading and really trying to make something that looks good with all the subjects. Yeah, cool. What's the, sorry, what does success look like in your photography? Recognition. Okay. I'm really aiming for recognition this year. I, I wanted to start entering a lot of, a lot more competitions, Sony competitions, photographer of the year competitions. Yeah, I think that's a big thing. I think living in such an isolated place, like the room is an isolated place. Yeah, you don't get much recognition because a lot of people don't see you work down this way as yeah. opposed to living in a city. There's no, there's a lot, it, you don't get to connect with a lot of people down here. There's not many photographers that yeah. get together and shoot. Whereas a lot of cities, everyone's together talking, meeting up for shoots and whatnot. Yeah. No, I'm, I'll give you that. There's definitely, uh, I, I think a bit of a community, it's certainly in Sydney, particularly around seascaping, there's a lot of people that do that. A lot of people get up in the Blue Mountains and that sort of thing. But yeah, I, I think, yeah. So how do you deal with a sense of isolation that you've got in terms of relationships with other photographers and that sort of thing? I really, I uh, try and come up to a couple of workshops around Sydney, Jerangong, Kaimba and that, try and connect with people and that. And I guess trying to gain reach online, posting to photography groups, yeah. like the Sony photography groups, seascape groups and that really, uh, yeah, just really trying to put myself out there. I think that's yeah. the only way I can do it on the South Coast because there's not many camera brands come down this way, running the workshops like they do in Sydney or the upper South Coast. Yeah. yeah. I guess it must be tough to get involved in some of those sorts of things. Yeah, because Sydney is probably about a four hour drive from here. It's not too far, but it is just to get in the car and go for a workshop. Yeah. And the room is just that little bit beyond, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of workshops closer in Canberra, but when you're yeah. more seascape focused. And yeah, you're not going to get a lot of seascapes in Canberra, no. <laughs> nah. <laughs> yeah. So are you doing this full time or is it part time? Uh, how does photography fit into your life? Yeah, I work full-time at the Aboriginal Medical Service in um, the room up. So I'm an audiometrist full-time. I go into all the schools, testing all the Indigenous kids for hearing losses and ear sure. infections. So I do that from Ulladulla to Eden. When I'm not doing that, I'm at home painting. And when I'm not home painting, I'm out in the field taking photos. I feel like I'm just relentlessly 24-7 work, trying to stay persistent until something happens. Yeah, fair enough. Is a goal of yours to... Become a full-time artist? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I'm pretty much working as a full-time artist as right now. I do a lot of jersey designs. Yeah. I designed jerseys for Parramatta Eels last year, the year before, and this year. I've done a lot of um, other jerseys and that. Design uh, clothing for workwear. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much working full-time as an artist as well. Okay. And how do you find that work-life photography, everything else balanced? It, it's it's kind of working for me. I try and use my, um, my artist profile to boost my photography profile and in the audience that I'm reaching with my photography, I try and use that to connect with my artist background as well. Yeah. yeah so it's working for me. The balance is pretty good. I, lo I just love being outdoors. I love staying busy and consistent. Excellent. So how do you bring that brand of yours? out into the world? Is it something that you are working on to try and get your name out there? Oh yeah, for sure. It's definitely, even just the name, local famous, I've got that because I lived, growing up, I moved a lot. My parents moved me around a lot. And then when I reached to my teenage years, I grew up and moved back home, met up with my family that we were disconnected with. So I lived in so many different towns. Whenever I went somewhere, whenever one of my friends went somewhere, they knew someone that I knew because I lived there and that's where the word local famous comes from. And then I thought local famous, such a unique name that someone would remember. Yeah. If they see local famous photography, they're going to be thinking, oh, well, what are these local famous spots kind of thing? So yeah, I right. kind of use it as an attention grabber. Excellent. Yeah. 
what do you think is the most important thing to remember about marketing your personal brand? For me, for me, it's my integrity. My integrity, especially with my Indigenous background, I feel like when I share a lot of my Indigenous artworks or my family, like photos of my family and that, I get a lot of people dropping off due to political stuff around Australia Day and all that kind of stuff, yes. which is a shame. But it's a letdown, but at the same time, I've got to stay true to myself and who my family is and whatnot. Yeah. Talking about family, uh, things like that, what ethical considerations should landscape photographers keep in mind when photographing on places that might be sacred. I was down at Bayamunga, uh, which is down near Tarthra, uh, or between Tarthra and Bega, actually, uh, about a week or two ago. And one of the things that I noticed there is obviously signs saying, don't go down into the creek because it's a, a sacred spot. And they've built a beautiful walkway that you can stay out of the little valley where the waterfall and everything is and the sacred pool. But I also noticed there was a number of people, they weren't necessarily photographers, but they were just tourists with their iPhones or whatever. And they were merrily just getting down yeah. there and going for a swim in the creek and whatever. And I guess how do things like that present themselves to, to you as an Indigenous person? To me, I think just the biggest thing is just having some, just having respect. And if you're not sure, reach out to someone in that community. Like there's a lot of land councils around here. Reach out to the land council. Even if you ask someone like, like, is it okay if I travel down here or meet up with someone that's local to ask them to take you. And then it's right. I was actually having this conversation with, I've uh, done my scuba, scuba diving calls over the weekend. Okay. And we're, and we're out at Tollgate Islands out Bayman's Bay. And, I was like, oh, it's such a shame that we can't go in there because it's a reserve and it's protected. Yeah. Because there's so many seascapes around that island, so beautiful. But at the same time, I understood why to preserve it, respect it. And some people just don't have that respect and would ruin, ruin what's out there. Yeah. Mm. So I think, yeah, just having the respect. If you're not sure, ask a local. And I guess that's all you can really do. Yeah. To me, I, I, I personally think it's a really important topic for landscape photographers in particular to remember there, there was a bit of a kerfuffle recently with somebody who uh, got fined i think it was down in tasmania for flying a drone and taking photos without having a, a permit and to me it, it's no different to that it, there, there's you know it might not necessarily be federal or state law but there's to me there's rules and laws that need to be followed and I'm really passionate about making people aware of some of the things that they need to be thinking about when they go into these areas. Yeah. And like some of them things might seem harmless at the time, yeah. but if everyone's going down and doing it, then it can become a problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with reaching out to locals or the local land council and whatnot. And you might have to, they might, it might, there might be someone down there that would give you a tour around and allow you to go down the areas, but. It's having someone around you that's local to the area that knows these special sites that yeah, can really like, yeah, show you around where you're not damaging things. I think it's, I think it's important for people to, to have a think about what they're doing before they go into some of these places, because certainly on the South coast, everywhere you go there has some kind of significance for the indigenous people of the area. Gulaga, which is the, the mother mountain down there at the back of Tilba, for example, yeah. and even some of the islands off the coast, they've, they've all got their stories and their, I guess, their place in the Aboriginal culture. And I think learning about that helps you understand the landscape and understand how people have related to the landscape for 40 odd thousand years. Exactly. And then like the South Coast was a big meeting place for a lot of tribes around Victoria. Even people from up my way, more e-ways, traveled down for the Bogon Moth festivals in the mountains. Yeah. At the yeah. back of Gulaga Mountain and whatnot. Like, it's such a huge storyline, song lines. Like you're saying, Gulaga Mountain's such a special place and there's a women's birthing ground there. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of tourists, like unknowingly, like it's not really a lot of signage up. They venture around the mountain and go to places that they shouldn't be going. Yeah. Uh, Nudge and Nook up, the next mountain across Mount Dromedary, the son yeah. of Gulaga. And Mondego Island, Barangoola, yeah, another special place, like huge special place to the Yulin people of the South Coast. Yeah. So how are this, 
that sort of those song lines, as you call them, influenced not so much what you shoot, but how you shoot. Yeah, I guess like a lot of my photos, like even when I'm even whale season, when I'm traveling along the coastline with my drone net and I'm trying to get some shots with School of the Mountain in the back. Yep. And I try and tell the song line, like the whales are a special song line to the Yuan people as well. Yeah. They have their own song lines and stories as well. But getting a photo of the whale with Ogula the Mountain in the background, like it's such a special thing. Like I can't really speak on it much. I'm not a Yuan man. I'm a Gamilaroi man. Mm -hmm. My daughter's a Yuan woman. But yeah, it makes me see things in a whole nother perspective and a yeah. whole nother respect for the land that I live on too. Yeah. For people that don't know the area, can you talk a little bit? We talked about some of the places there, but can you talk a little bit about what the conditions are like on, on the South coast and the kind of things people can expect? Yes. You've got the iconic, what I said, and camel and glasshouse rocks and, and those sorts of things. The sea stacks are there, but I guess talk to me a little bit about some of the other things people can expect to see down there. Oh, the South coast is like, I've like I'm lost for words sometimes when I'm explaining it, especially when I go home and tell family about it. Like, oh, there's no place like it. Starting at Janus Bay, the whitest sands in the world, yeah. aqua blue waters, brain nurse sharks, wobby gongs, a all the way down to Ulladulla, Pigeon Out Mountains, a good walk, mm -hmm. a good bushland lookout. Down the Borley Point, another beautiful place, beautiful beaches, Pebbly Beach, the Murray Marine National Parks. A lot yep. of people go down there and see the kangaroos on the beach, yeah, yeah. the Wenners. Yep. Turos Heads, another beautiful place, a lesser known place. Like just last week, Someone filmed a Gawena walking off the beach, swimming through the ocean up to a kayak. Oh, wow. I've never seen it. I've never no, seen I've a never seen swim that. in the ocean. I'll, I'll have to yeah. go looking for that now. <laughs> yeah, it's on Facebook. Yeah, talking to Ross Heads, um, Gawena, yeah. Down the room, I like everyone's familiar with the room. There's a lot of lesser known places that, that are hidden in plain sight, like Kangaroo Rock. I don't yeah. think you've seen Kangaroo Rock. Down yeah, at Glass I've, House I've Rocks. Stay, taken a couple of shots of that and, and Glass House. So I've actually got a a nice shot of glass house on the wall here that I, I caught just as the sun was setting and it's just across the top of the, uh, the sea stacks and I, oh, beautiful. Uh, and a they're beautiful reflected place. In, in the water on the sand at the bottom and everything. Uh, oh yeah. How beautiful. But yeah, kangaroo rock, not even a lot of no locals know about it when I put up. Yeah, well, you you can walk past yeah. it and, unless you're actually looking at it from a certain angle, you're not going to recognize it. Yeah, you're not going to recognize it. Other beautiful places like One Tree at Cudigy, the Arch at Gorilla Bay is another special beautiful place. Yeah, I haven't shot down there. It's definitely on the list. There's way yeah, yeah. too have, many. <laughs> have you seen the Arch? I have, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful spot. That was another spot that I've seen. A, a lot of locals try and keep it. Actually, I actually don't want yeah, people knowing about it. Very hard uh, in these days, though. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard. So I actually got someone to show me where it was and I actually, that's where one of my challenges was. I tried to get in that split level shot of the arch, half uh, underwater, half above, because I hadn't seen that done before. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Bernagui, obviously Horsehead, Camel Rock, the Galuga Mountain. There's a lot of huge rock with stories behind it as well, up on the yeah. mountain. Where else? Cartagy, Aragonu is a lovely place. Yeah. I love Aragonu. It's one of my favorites down there. And mind you, I've got a lot of favorites down there. There's it's endless. Yeah, it is. Ar Aragonu is so lovely, but the big, large pebbles on the beach. Yeah. I love that. But yeah, I, there's so many places I still haven't discovered. Mystery Bay is one of my favorite places. If anyone gets a chance to go check that out. Yeah. There's a camping ground right on the headland with around crystal clear waters. It's probably one of the best spots to watch the whales as well. Yeah. Whales come closer there than anywhere else on the coast. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Let's get down here, explore it. I'm still exploring it. I spend endless days just hiking along the coastline. Yeah. Have you got a spot that just keeps calling you back? Mystery Bay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love Mystery Bay, Gorilla Bay. Yeah. Yeah. Kangaroo Rock. They're all special to me. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. What's your most memorable experience out shooting? I think my most memorable was Horsehead when I first moved to the coast. Yeah. Just seeing it in the photos, like just seeing it in person just doesn't do it justice. Yeah. The size of it, like it's just majestic. Majest well, even just getting to it. Oh, yeah. You've got to time it. You've got to make sure that if, if you don't time it, 
you've got waterproof bags and whatever. So otherwise you're going to go for I've a swim. Been, I've been stuck over there a couple of times. Yeah. Lost track of time. Just you got to get this shot. Pack get this shot. Otherwise, if you do get stuck, you're there for a few hours, aren't you? Oh, yeah. I actually lost a drone there a couple of months ago. Oh, no. I was, trying to, I was trying to do a halo around horse head. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the wind blew it against the horse. And I was like, oh, damn. But it's one of, yeah, it definitely is a place you have to check the conditions before you go out. Yeah. It can be really dangerous. It can be a really dangerous place. Not even just the water and that. There's a lot of snakes, yeah. fallen rocks from the cliff side as well. I feel it. I see a lot of people trying to hang off the lookout at yeah. the top. And it's just like, why? Why? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't understand that either. Nah, but yeah. And the whole coastline's beautiful. Snow queen. Underwater photography, it's endless. Yeah, it's fantastic. You got any horror stories? I was actually hiking from Mishu Bay along the coastline towards Tilba to do some astro stuff. Yep. And I was by myself because obviously no one really likes photography down this way as much. So I'm always on the beaches by myself at night. Yeah. And I got halfway to Tilba and the tide rose up and I was stuck on these rocks and I kept looking up at the bush and there was these glowing eyes and that. And I was like, oh, it's just kangaroos. Just trying to ease myself. Yeah. And I was walking along the beach and I seen these big dog paw prints. Well, no. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, like, look, there was no human footprints even, so it wasn't dog walkers. And I got stuck on the beach, so I had to cut back through the national park. And as I was looking for the national park, there was a sign up saying, beware of wild dogs. And I was like, oh, no. I didn't even know they had wild dogs down here. So I was gurgling on my way back through the bush and learning there was dog attacks last year. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. People got attacked by wild dogs, their cattle being killed. And I was so are they, kind of are these domestic dogs that have gone wild or are they dingoes? Nah, dingoes. Right. Dingoes. And a lot of the dingoes have bred with the domestic dogs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Become feral. So it was like one of the moments I was like, oh, no, what have I done? It deterred me from not wanting to be on the beach by myself at night. Sorry. Yeah. Wild dogs. What has the practice of photography taught you about the world? I think. I view the world in a whole nother respect with photography now. I was thinking about this the other day, just looking at Australia rock in the Rima. Yep. Just how much it's starting to degrade and fall apart. Yeah. And I just think like all these things aren't going to be around forever and we really have to look after things. Yeah. You've only got to have a look at the the 12 apostles, which is now six or seven, I think, are left now. They're sea stacks. They used to be part of the, the mainland cliffs and they've carved off. So it's erosion that yeah. is constantly working at these things. And Australia Rock and Horsehead and all of those, they're all symptoms of the same thing. And uh, you're right, they won't be around forever. Yeah. And I think also, like, I also lived in Batemans Bay and the water up here is not as clear as in the rumors. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people are saying it's from tourism and people leaving rubbish around all the time yeah, when holidays right. come. And I think just respecting our waterways, like the room is paradise. Like you don't got to fly to Fiji and see crystal clear water. You can go down the room up. And that's another thing that could be spoiled if not taken care of. Absolutely. Absolutely. What about how you learnt to process and learnt to do your photography? Where did that come from? Was that formal learning? Was it self-taught? Did you have a mentor or anything? No. Nah, a lot of it was just YouTube videos. Okay. So I'd see a photographer I'd like across Instagram or Facebook and I'd really look at their photos and I'd be like, oh, that, I really like the look of that. I'd look into what gear they were using and then I'd just muck around with, yeah, success or failure. Yeah, Trying right. Trying things with the color grading. Like I'd look at, a, t- a technique I learned last year was time blending. Like I'd always looked at astrophotography photos a photographer named Chungi from Sydney, I think he is. Yeah, no, no Chungi. Yep. Yeah, I see a lot of his photos with the Milky Way, but then the sunrise glow, and I was like, how do you do that? And then I'd search relentlessly looking for it and realize it's time blending. Yeah. So just even looking at people's photography and then reaching out to them or searching up on YouTube has been the biggest teacher for me. And it's, I was looking that up for astro photography, but I found myself doing time blends at Sea Cliff Bridge. Yep. With the light streaks across the bridge and the golden hour glow on the bottom, nice. milky way at the top. Yeah. Just being creative and just, I'm on YouTube every day looking up photography techniques. Yeah, fair enough. So when it comes to the processing, you straight in when you get home from a, a shoot or do you leave it for a while? I'm straight into it. 
Or mm. if I'm if someone's driving me back, I'm I've got my laptop with me. Okay. I'm, I'm editing on site. A couple of people I go out on shoots around here. We'll take photos and I'll get home and it'll be like seven thirty and I'm already uploading mine to Instagram. He's, I haven't even looked at my photos yet. So how long are you spending on an edit? I try not to spend more than an hour. I feel like the longer I spend on an edit, the more I overdo it. Yeah, yeah. I sometimes agree. Sometimes you, you just overcook them and you go, I've done that a few times and this gone scrap the whole thing, go back to the original raw and even reprocess the process the raw. Yeah. Get it, getting the lighting right. And a lot. I think comes down to making sure that you've got the right color separation and you've got to do that before you start doing the color grading itself. The, that separation of colors is one of the important things to do in, in your processing before you get there into the grading side of things. Yeah, I completely agree. Color separation is such a huge thing. I find myself looking at old photos on Instagram that I've taken, love the composition and that, and I was just look at the edit and I was like, why did I post that? I'll delete it and I'll go back and re-edit it with the new techniques I've learned and I'll yeah. re-upload it. Okay. I don't delete anything. I just leave it because it's where I was at that time. So there's uh, some real rubbish photos up there from me. I guess it shows your progress and it shows people how far you've progressed and come as a photographer. Yeah. And I, I think it's an important thing to do to look back at where you were and where you are now. Do you do a lot of that? Yeah, I definitely do. Especially, especially like with astrophotography and stuff, I'll look back, I'll pixel peep how sharp I got stars or how much noise there was in a photo and where my focus was. As I've journeyed with photography, I've picked up techniques like focus stacking. Yeah. And yeah. then I was just going for a phase of focus stacking everything. And then I've grown into watching people edit their photos on YouTube and adding depth and that. Now I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't focus that. Maybe I should leave that depth in the background. But I guess it's like what you're trying to, what you see when you're out there and what you want your edit to be as well in a creative yeah. perspective. Oh, it's, a, it's all about creative choices, isn't it? You've got to, you've got to decide what you're going to do. And sometimes that starts in the field or even before you get in the field, but other times it's a process that you get into at the end. Yeah. What do you think about the new AI photography style? I don't see, if you're talking about the stuff inside Photoshop, for example, where it'll do autofill and whatever, I think that's okay for some of the edges of things. I really like the object removal tools. Oh yeah. Just get rid of rubbish. When I say rubbish, it's just extraneous stuff that you don't want in your composition that was there. And yeah, okay. There's some people that say, well, that's the shot and it's got everything in it. But to me, there's, there's a telegraph pole that's in the middle distance that is a bit of a distraction. I'm going to, I'm going to ditch it because oh, yeah. I don't want to, that's not what the scene's about. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I was, I was talking about like the, how they generate whole images. Oh, the. Yeah, the IA generated imagery. I don't call that photography personally. To me, it is, and I'm not even certain. I guess you could call it art. There's a art in creating the prompts that you need to put together to come up with something that you want. There's definitely some ethical question around what's fed that image. And I know that there are people that have taken their own photography, fed that in and used that as the base. That's legitimate. And that, I guess, is a, a form of art. I just don't, in terms of landscapes, I don't see it as being something that is terribly interesting because a, a fake landscape that doesn't exist doesn't really interest me. Yeah, it might be pretty to look at and you go, oh, oh that's nice. But beyond that, not that, that fast. I would be worried, though, if I was a product or a fashion photographer in and, and I don't mean the top end guys. I'm talking about a, a middle of the road yeah. photographer in that, in those genres, because I can see companies with dollar signs in their eyes saying, oh, I can do this for virtually nothing as opposed to paying three, 400, 500 bucks an hour for a photographer plus models, plus all of the extraneous bits and whatever that they'll get charged for. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think there's a, there's 
for me, it's real ethical as well when people post it up as a photo and don't really put it out there. It's oh, yeah. Any, anyone that's trying to deceive people, bugger that. That's just being dishonest. Yeah. Like I felt catfished a couple of times seeing a yeah. seascape with these pretty flowers on the edge, waves, star, star, a starburst. I'm like, where's that? Yeah. Try and look it up and then realize that it's not even real. I'm like, no, that's it. Yeah. I saw Kenneth LaRose actually, he posted something. I think it might've been on Facebook. I'm not sure, but he had one of his image as fed into an AI and a photography in inverted commas group posting without any kind of credit to it. And he posted his image and their image side by side. And yes, they're different, but you can see where the AI generation based was based on his image yeah. uh, because the elements that are in there. I think it was a cactus with a, a moon set. And he took the time to go out there into the desert and take this photo of these cactus and the moon setting and these clouds across it and whatever. And somebody's li- literally ripped that image and fed it into an AI and, and then trying to palm it off as actual photography. Yeah, see, that's unethical. And then I guess people don't understand that as well. All the hours people spend at night, especially with astrophotography, a lot of their nights, you can get thousand images and there could be one thing off whether it's focus or, and that could be a whole night wasted. Yeah. So a lot like, of people, in, a lot of people invest countless nights out in the field. And then yeah. for some of the common, just feed it to AIs, especially. Think, think of taking a full moon shot. You get one of them a month, every 28 days, there's a full moon. So there's lots of opportunities, but the full moon won't be in exactly the same spot in 28 days to where it is there. So if you miss that then you're actually talking about 12 months before you yeah, can 12 months take, time. take that shot again to get the exact shot. You can take one that's close, but won't, won't be quite the same. And anything can change in that time. That cactus could die. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything. So yeah, I think if the person's not going to credit the photographer, that's just not, it's not right. And yeah, no. I guess one of, one of the things I'm always interested in is how you look at your work in the end product. Are you printing much of your work or are you just posting it on social media and it's only ever seen there? I do. I have been doing a lot of prints lately. I've had a lot of people requesting them and yeah, I have been doing a lot of prints, but only for local people. Yeah. Right. A lot of my stuff is just for social media. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm just interested to me. I, one of the things I do is I actually, and I'm in the middle of creating one at the moment is create a book each year. I don't try to sell it to anyone. This is my, I like the old photo albums. I'm an old fogey, so to <laughs> me, right. there's nothing nicer than leafing through a, a nicely printed book that actually has your work in it. And it's yeah. not every shot. It's just selected shots get in there. And to me, it's, it's one of the nicest ways of actually engaging with your own photography. Yeah, hundred percent. I feel I was going to do one of them coffee table books as well, just to sit around for guests to come and look at when they're at home yeah. having dinner or something. I agree. I think it's a good point of reflection. Yeah, cool. What do you do if you, sorry, I'm going to ask that again. Have you ever hit a creative wall? And if so, how did you do deal with that? Do you have any techniques that you can share that you might have used to get around those creative slumps that people get into? Yeah. I get creators block quite easily and it could just be from like my everyday life, like mental health. I could be feeling a bit down every week and then something that I was trying to achieve in photography just wasn't happening for me. The creators block would just hit me hard and I'd find it so hard to get out of it. I find the easiest way for me to get out of that is to try something completely different. Yeah, right. Assist with it so I don't get frustrated from not completing it as determined as I am sometimes to do it until I accomplish it. But I feel like to get my creative creative block back, I'll go from say astrophotography to underwater photography until I'm happy with something. I'm like, oh, that's a mad shot. And then it boosts me back up. And then I'll go back to what I was trying to do before with a level head. Cool. What do you think is the future of photography? I think the future of photography is tourism. Now COVID's over. A lot of podcasts, product reviews. But it's scary with all this AI stuff as well. I think about that a lot. Yeah. 
I'm less concerned about that in terms of landscapes. As I say, if I was a product or a, uh, a fashion photographer, I'd be a little bit more concerned about where my money's coming from. But I think the landscape, not that there's a lot of money in landscape photography, but I think for a landscape person, I suspect that there's going to be more value in a real image that you can guarantee I went out I actually shot this. Now, whether that's got time blending or focus stacking or whatever, or it's a composite, and it could be a composite of the same place at different times, for example, you know, yeah, they, that doesn't matter. What matters more is that you've actually got off your backside and got out there and, and done it. I completely agree. I was talking to someone about that the other day with composite photos. A lot of people in Asher photography, they'll get a photo of the sky, they'll go to a location a few weeks later get that location and just blend two different times. And a lot of people find that unethical, but I think you're out there, you're out there in the field, it's your creative direction. Yeah. If, yeah. if you want to do that, just be honest about it. Yeah. As long as you're open and, and transparent about it, I, I don't think there's any issues. And even if you have incorporated something that's AI generated, you've, I, at the moment, I mostly use the, the tools in uh, Photoshop more for removing stuff than adding yeah, stuff. Just but, normal um, stuff, yeah. I've played around with a crop just to see what it would do if you if you've got if your lines a bit out of whack and uh, you put a crop and a generative expand just to fill in the corners that you, you cut off. Yeah. I don't have a massive problem with that. If it's just a water or grass or sky, it's not material to the... It's not like I've drawn a box in the middle and said, put a a seagull in the middle of my shot or whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, I completely agree. I've been stuck with some underwater shots where the reflection of the ripples have looked perfect on one half and on the other half it's just been straight lines and I've played with that, trying to fix it up. If you're open and honest about it, I, I don't have a problem with it. Oh, 100%. And then like you're saying, it's not like you're drawing a box and, and like putting you a UFO or a black swan <laughs> flying across the, a black swan flying across Gulaga Mountain. With, yeah. Like just adding elements all in there. Yeah. You might as well just AI generate the whole photo. I remember seeing somebody did the Aurora over, over the opera house. So it was looking at the opera house from the Harbour Bridge side of things. So you look looking east, but there's this Aurora coming up over the top of it. Last. Oh. Like, okay. That's an interesting creative choice, but definitely not possible. Yeah. Oh yeah. There was a photo I'd done at the Arch in Gorilla Bay, a composite photo with the Milky Way rising along it. And just, it's just one of them spots that just wouldn't happen. Yeah. But I also put in the photo distance. A composite, I've always wanted this to happen, but I know it's not going to happen. Yeah. But this is just, I wanted to see what it looked like. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. What's your favourite thing about being a photographer? Endless possibility, endless creativity, just being out in nature, setting all new spots. And yeah, not sitting at home watching TV. I just love being out in nature, seeing everything. Going to new places, yeah. learning, learning, learning. I love it. Yeah. What's your least favorite thing about being a photographer? The money, the pricing. That you just never stop buying things. There's always something that you want next. Yeah. I've the- got to get this <laughs> lens. I've got to get yeah, this, you do, you do, this flash. <laughs> you, you do get a, a gear addiction, unfortunately. Oh, it gets me in arguments at home all the time with my partner. Yeah. What are you buying now? Yeah. I'm being fairly judicious about what I'm, I'm still using a 6D. I haven't jumped to mirrorless yet, but I guess at some point I will when th- this thing dies and I need to replace it. It'll have to be uh, a mirrorless, I think. Yeah. I was talking to uh, another local photographer today about camera upgrades. You probably see him online, Josh Birkinshaw. Yeah, I know Josh. Yep. Yeah. He come over today, me and him were talking about upgrading. And then it's just, there's just not really much of a point. Like, yeah, new cameras are coming out all the time with little features, but they're always missing something. Yeah. Like each camera model has its own little thing. It's not yeah, it's like you could do video and photography all in one. So I guess unless it's worth upgrading, save your money. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm more, more into uh, spending on lenses than anything else. Yeah. Well, that's become my new addiction now, lenses. Quality glass. I bought a couple of lenses uh, a couple of weeks ago and then I've taken them in to uh, shoot some underwater stuff and it's, I just didn't like the way that the pictures come out. It was too soft. And I was like, oh, 
I'll sell this one and I'll go and buy another one. And I guess it's like real, yeah, you just don't know until you get out in the field with them. Fair enough. What's the best and or worst piece of advice you've ever been given? The best or worst piece of advice? Oh, God, that's hard. Like for photography? Or just no, it could be, it could be life, the universe, anything. Well, the best piece of advice I got was probably from my uncle. He said, some, name, some names will open doors to you and some names are closed. So like when you're name dropping, say, family members or friends, yeah, some people are like, oh, you know, it's such and such, and it's so good. And other people might just change their whole opinion on you because you're associated. Because with you're person. associated with them. Yeah. But I, that is probably the best piece of advice I've ever received in life. Yeah. Some names will open doors and some names will close them. Yeah, no, that's nice. I like that. Are there any photographers out there that you think I should be talking to? Like I was saying, I'm on the South Coast where there's not many photographers. There's a, a really good photographer. I feel like he's pretty well known on uh, Instagram and he's, Instagram names two locked Aussies. Yep. I think he's a really underrated photographer. I go out and shoot with him every now and then. Mm-hmm. And the only other two photographers I've been really paying attention to, or three, is Josh Berkinshaw. Yep. Jordan Robbins, if you've seen his stuff. I can't say I have, actually. I might have, but I don't recall his name. He's, a, he's probably like one of the best underwater photographers in Australia. He's, yeah, cool. He's from Jervis Bay. Yeah, look him up, Jordan Robbins. Uh, he does a lot of split level photography as well. And actually, now, yeah, now you've said what he does, I, I do follow him. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And Changi, I, well, no, I don't really, I can't really think of anyone else, but they the last three are pretty well known photographers like Jordan, Josh, and yeah, like, Changi. I've had Josh and Changi on the show before. Yeah. But yeah. Two lost Aussies. I'd give a shout out to him. All right. I'll, I'll give Andrew a shout then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. It's been wonderful talking to you. I've got one more question and uh, it's the one that a lot of my listeners are trying to get to the bottom of. Do you like pineapple on pizza? Love it. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? It's my favorite pizza. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Sean. It's been wonderful uh, having a chat and uh, I'd like to give your stuff a bit of a pup now and uh, let people know where, where they can find your work. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you um, reaching out and love your work as well. Thank you. Thank you. So where can people find your work, mate? On Instagram, local famous photography on my photography side, a lot of my artwork on local famous. Yeah. Just anything, type in local famous, you'll see my name come up. Cool. On Google, social medias, it comes up straight away. No worries. I'll, I'll go hunting and I'll put all the links in the show notes for you. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Appreciate it, Grant. All right. Thanks, mate. All right. See you, buddy. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you've enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon.